the very porous. We think that this is the kind of rock that would have been in contact with water on the early Earth. He'll expose them to a real-world setting, inside a hot vent at the Kilauea volcano in Hawaii. So here's the first sample of DNA. It soaks down into this porous lava. Some people think that those porous compartments are actually part of uh, how life began because they provided a protective compartment for some of the reactions that we're interested in. As Dr. Dima prepares to find out once and for all if first life could have begun in the heat of a volcanic environment, two more teams of scientists, one at Harvard, the other at Southern Denmark University, are pursuing the question of life's origins in a whole new way by racing to be the first to create it in the lab. Three teams of scientists from around the world aim to be the first to create life from scratch. In Denmark, Dr. Steen Rasmussen heads up the effort. So how are things going? Uh, it's very good. Uh... I believe life can be made in the laboratory, and I think that life can be made in many different ways. I don't think there's just one way to do it. I believe that there's a variety of designs out here. Different research groups are pursuing different ways of doing it. And I think that uh, I'd be very surprised if we won't be able to implement several different minimal or very simple living systems. Cells are the smallest unit of life. Organisms range in size from just a single cell to trillions of cells. But at their most basic level, all cells must have three things in order to survive. DNA, the information needed to build and reproduce. Metabolism, the ability to take in food, change it into energy and discard waste. And a membrane, a container to hold and protect it all. Like in the video game Spore, the ultimate goal is to create new forms of complex, multicellular life. You unfortunately can't make anything that's like Frankenstein or what you see in Terminator. What we're attempting to do is make a life form that's way, way simpler than the simplest modern life form. So it'll be something that's a million times lighter or smaller than, than the tiniest modern bacterium. So it's very, very primitive life. These magnified fatty amino acids aren't alive, but they are critical for life. Like soap bubbles, adding water to fatty acids causes them to self-assemble into round vesicles, containers perfect for holding and protecting a cell's functions and DNA information. A container or membrane is the first step for creating life. For the Danish team's recipe, they begin with a small dash of ruthenium. Ruthenium is a rare, durable metal usually used for jet engine turbines and computer chips. And while it may not have been part of the first life on early Earth, for creating life in the lab, ruthenium is valuable for one critical quality. It absorbs light. That quality provides enough energy for basic functions in the team's simple cell or protocell. Once the solution turns orange, that means the ruthenium is mixed evenly and is ready for the next step. We try to make our protocell from materials that are as simple as possible. We want to go from the non-living material to the living material, so we, we actually make this transition from non-living to, to living. That's the important part, and it's not so easy to do that. A second team member prepares a test tube of fatty acids in salt water over a magnetic mixer. Well, it, it's very simple. Under this plate, we have a disc that turns continuously and basically is magnetized. And here we have a little magnet, and that will follow the magnet. The small white magnet provides an even stir. A steady stir ensures the ruthenium gets mixed evenly throughout. And now I will start titrating, as we call it, adding acid to permit the spontaneous formation. When the final ingredient, hydrochloric acid, is added, 
This even mix provides the best chance for self-assembly of protocell membranes. The cloudy texture means that self-assembly is successful. The membranes are visible only under magnification. I can clearly see that I have formed a membrane about 1,000 to 10,000 times smaller than your hair. This is the first step toward creating life. But there's a problem. The team must figure out how to insert life's last two elements, a metabolism and a gene-like information molecule, inside. In a normal living cell, the membrane is controlled by special proteins, gatekeepers that invite what's needed and repel what's not. But creating these proteins is far too advanced for a simple protocell. So to overcome this problem, the Danish team comes up with a revolutionary idea, moving the protocell's insides to its outsides. The team chemically attaches genetic material to the outside of the membrane. This eliminates the difficulty of moving resources in and out of the cell. So this whole monkey business of getting things through a membrane, you can completely avoid by uh, turning the cell inside out so that you can view your cell more as a used piece of chewing gum or play-doh and then you can actually put the different components to the surface of it. So then you have your container um, decorated with, 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 your, with your genes and with your metabolic complexes and uh, they stick, you know, so, so it is a container. They contain them, they make sure that these things are uh, close to each other. These inside-out protocells can never exist outside of a test tube. Still, even with this simple protocell, the team hasn't figured out how to make them divide to reproduce another generation on their own, a critical function for all life. Nearly 6,000 kilometers across the Atlantic, the team at Harvard's Life Initiative has figured out a simple solution. Dr. Jack Sostak and graduate student Ting Zhu have determined how to get their membrane vesicle to spontaneously divide without turning it inside out. These membrane vesicles, we can make them grow and divide all by themselves. For a long time, we were just thinking about growth in too simplistic a way. We thought of uh, starting off with a spherical vesicle and just it would just get bigger. A vesicle membrane can grow when small fatty acids, or micelles, combine with the fatty acids already in the membrane, causing it to expand. But that type of growth creates difficulty when it comes to division. It's really hard to make a spherical vesicle divide. You have to change the shape. It takes a lot of energy. To conserve energy, Ting Zhu developed a groundbreaking process. Vesicle division by simple environmental vibration. Vibration similar to those from a current or wave. The vesicles are growing and the tail coming out. Under the microscope, those micelles are growing in a long filament stemming from the vesicle membrane. It actually grows in this surprising way by, uh, by building this uh, filamentous extension. Eventually, everything in the round vesicle will go into a long filament. After the vesicles grow into filaments, the team vibrates the filaments, creating new vesicle membranes. The nice thing is that 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 long filamentous vesicle that's forming is very fragile and so it just takes gentle shaking to make that divide into daughter vesicles. This is a significant step toward creating life. Membranes that grow spontaneously yeah. on their own. But it's still a long way from a living being. One critical part is still missing. Working out how complex genetic molecules like DNA or RNA replicate fully on their own. But in Hawaii, Dr. David Deemer may be on the verge of just such a breakthrough. Scientists believe volcanoes were integral to the creation of first life on Earth. 
Biochemist Dr. David Dima wants to know for sure. Oh, look at that. Isn't that spectacular? This is just what I came for. These real-world conditions at Mount Kilauea in Hawaii's Volcano National Park approximate Earth's early environment. Right on the edge of the Kilauea caldera, this is a hot area as part of the volcanic activity. And this is where the heat from this magma that is driving the volcano warms up this part of the site of the volcanic area. A caldera is a cauldron-like pit usually formed by the collapse of land following a volcanic eruption. Scientists believe when life first appeared, the Earth was full of places like this one. Here, hot gas vents emit water vapor, hydrogen sulfide and sulfur to form a crusty surface. Everybody used to think, and I'm sure most people still think, that life began in the ocean. But there's too much calcium, too much magnesium, too much ferrous iron on the early earth and the ocean at that time. There were volcanoes back then, and there would be rain back then. So we had now have a freshwater environment. Now you can do a lot of things in freshwater that just don't work in a marine environment. So that's one of the reasons I like to come to places like this and uh, see what it was like some four billion years ago when water began to condense on early volcanic land masses. But life requires more than just fresh water. It also requires an energy source. A volcano provides that energy through heat and reactive chemicals. Dr. Demo.